Good evening, dear colleagues. Good evening, dear friends. Again, it's Wednesday, and Wednesday means webinars for the EAG. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this satellite uh, symposium, this satellite webinar on the advances on small bowel therapy, uh, hosted by EAG, but supported by Olympus. I'm uh, Dr. Konstantinos Redafilou from Athens, Greece. And as you already know, uh, this is the third consecutive year that EAG offers you the opportunity uh, to see uh, the uh, high quality presentation from our speakers. Uh, at this moment, I would like to thank our corporate partner, uh, namely Olympus, uh, for this, for the continued support, and of course, for providing the opportunity to share with you uh, uh, this webinar. And beyond the, the opportunity to see uh, excellent presentation on the hottest topic of, uh, uh, of endoscopy, uh, you can know that this, you know that this is an interactive uh, uh, webinar, so you can interact with the speakers and participate by submit, submitting online your questions. And if you could focus on the <coughs> excuse me on the top on the bottom of your screen, then you can find the Q and A tool where you can post questions throughout the presentation. And still, again, for this year, uh, uh, this activity, this EAG activity is free. So please follow us. And at this moment, I would like to introduce our panelists, uh, Professor Mariana Arvanitakis from Brussels, Belgium, and Dr. Torsten Benja from Dusseldorf, uh, Germany. And I would like to, uh, hello, Torsten. And- hello, Good evening to everybody. Very, very happy that you accepted the invitation to be with us. And uh, hopefully uh, we will see soon Mariana uh, to start her presentation. Mariana. Hello, everybody. I'm here. Welcome. Thank you very much for being with us. We are looking forward to, uh, to see your presentation and uh, then Torsten will follow. Okay. So um, I'm going to show uh, what we have been doing up to now regarding mid-gut exploration. Um, and um, uh, what we have achieved. So this is the agenda of my talk, a little bit on the background. I'm going to talk about the diagnostic exploration uh, that we have uh, uh, for the small bowel, which is mostly uh, capsule endoscopy. Uh, a little bit, very little bit about cross-sectional uh, enterography and uh, uh, device-assisted enteroscopy, where I'm going to go a bit in more details of what uh, devices we have available up to now and some technical considerations. Finally, uh, very important quality. There's also quality and performance measures in small bowel endoscopy and uh, a, a, a small summary. So we know that the small bowel is a, a difficult organ to explore because it's, uh, it's long, it's floppy, it's behind, uh, uh, it's tucked uh, between the colon, the spine, the pelvis. So uh, uh, it's been difficult to, to explore. Uh, and uh, we started uh, in the beginning by uh, pushing down a longer um, tube and an enteroscope. This is push enteroscopy but uh, we managed to get a bit further, more, further down the uh, traits angle. Uh, but there was a lot, a, a big part of the small bowel that we could, still couldn't explore. And then came um, video capsule endoscopy, which really um, allowed us to, to uh, fully explore the small bowel. Uh, and uh, this has really uh, been the cornerstone of, uh, of diagnostics in, in small bowel. And once we started seeing things in the small bowel, we wanted to get, be able to get there to do therapeutics. This is where um, device enteroscopy comes in. And I will start with the four systems that have been developed up to now. So uh, what are the diagnostic indications for small bowel capsule enteroscopy? Uh, these are very nicely outlined in the, in the paper from SPADA uh, uh, in, uh, in endoscopy on performance measures for small bowel enteroscopy. And these are the, the uh, accepted diagnostic indications. So it's obscure GI bleeding. Uh, meaning when there is a, 
um, overt uh, bleeding with melena and uh, gastroscopy and colonoscopy have disclosed no findings. In case of indeterminate iron deficiency anemia, again, when uh, basic exploration with uh, gastroscopy and colonoscopy uh, have found nothing. Uh, suspected or known Crohn's disease, refractory celiac disease, investigation in some polyposis syndromes like a Page Jagger syndrome. When you have uh, imaging tests, uh, CT scan, for example, there is suspicion for a small bowel tumor. And finally, in, in some cases of neoplastic surveillance, such as lymphoma and melanoma. Um, this algorithm is, um, is very useful uh, for uh, the exploration that we required in the suspected small bowel bleeding. This is when you have uh, overt bleeding with gastroscopy and colonoscopy that have been uh, uh, not normal or iron deficiency anemia again with normal gastroscopy and colonoscopy. So you have two situations, uh, either the bleeding is overt, meaning that you have melena uh, or a cult when there's no uh, um, clinical signs of bleeding, but you might may have um, a, a positive FOBT. In case of overt bleeding, when you have hemodynamic instability, you may go immediately to device assisted enteroscopy to have a, a, a therapeutic action as well. But most of the time we will uh, go to um, video capsule endoscopy as a first step diagnostic um, uh, technique. If this is positive, then you will go to a specific management, which is most of the time will require device assisted enteroscopy. And if it's negative, uh, we accept a clinical follow-up with the wait and see policy to see if this there is a recurrence. And if there's a recurrence again, then you will, uh, uh, either repeat video capsule, either go immediately to uh, device assistant enteroscopy, either to um, uh, CT scan, and then uh, after that specific management. Now, if you have a young patient, uh, you might want to uh, put the CT scan, for example, further up in this uh, in this uh, time zone, uh, just to be sure that you are not uh, missing a, a small bowel tumor, which is more uh, frequent in, in younger patients. Uh, two things to remember is that video capsule endoscopy does not give the answer all the time, even if we have a great improvement in the in the diagnostics, and I will show you later. And we still have a pool diagnostic yield of 61%, and you do have uh, false negatives up to uh, 17%. So uh, a negative video capsule endoscopy does not mean definitely no findings. And also that you will gain in this diagnostic yield if you if you try to do the video capsule uh, near the overt bleeding episode. So if the patient has melina, you will try to do the video capsule within 14 days of this episode and you will increase your diagnostic yield. So going back to the different uh, uh, types that we have, we have a lot of uh, companies that have come up with, with video capsule with uh, um, different modalities. We even have some longer recording times, as you see here, and uh, a 360 view angle with the new, uh, with the new bottles. Uh, and uh, this uh, has also, uh, we also have a really improvement in uh, the definition, as you see here, with the latest generation of capsules. And also we have adaptable frame, which means that when the capsule will go quickly, the frame will increase to avoid missing uh, any images. So what are the findings that you, was, you can find? And also you have to describe, first of all, the, the findings in the lumen, if there's a stricture and a dilation, evidence of previous surgery, contents, blood, clots, parasites, foreign body, um, mucosa can be erythematous, pale, nodular, atrophic, congestive. You can have flat lesions, which is the vascular lesions that we mostly find. Uh, protruding lesions, uh, nodules like some mucosal uh, tumors, polyps, uh, a, a tumor or a, a viruses, a venous structure, and finally excavated lesions, which are mostly orospheres and erosions. So these findings have to be put into the context, the clinical context, the age of the patient, if he has any comorbidities. So these are very important to know before you start reading the capsule. And you also have to put them in your report. As I'm going to say later on, this is also important. So uh, according to the age, you will find in, in younger patients, you will find in macular diverticulum. In the older patients, you will find uh, mostly vascular diseases, meaning um, angiomas and tumors, polyps, and different kinds of ulcers related to Crohn's disease or NSAIDs uh, um, induced will be uh, somewhere in the middle. So age and uh, comorbidities, clinical setting is important 
to record. These are some of the images that we can find. So you, you know this, the telangiectasias that we try to find, and we can also go and um, uh, coagulate them with APC and also polyps that can be resected. Uh, this is um, uh, ulcers we can find related to Crohn's disease or um, NSAID. So it's also very important to uh, ask what kind of uh, medication the patient takes. Um, I'll go back. So now the reporting, this is important. Um, it's also uh, retained in the performance measures. It's important to talk about the system that you're going to use, the date and time of the procedure, the type of capsule, uh, democratics and the clinical um, information about the patients, the indication, uh, the type of bowel preparation and medications, as we said. And uh, in, the, in the reports, the quality of bowel preparation is important. Uh, the, if the examination is complete, if you have uh, seen the beginning of the colon, so uh, the cecum, if you have seen all the, the small bowel, uh, the key times in entry into various portions of the GI tract, so the, the, if you pass the pylorus, if you pass the, the um, ilocecal valve, these are important points to, to, uh, to record and to, to put the time that you pass. Any relevant findings and also any pertinent negatives. If there's no blood, you have to say there's no blood. If there's any adverse effects, there's not a lot of adverse events, uh, fortunately, but if it goes in the trachea, this has to be um, reported as well as if it stays in the stomach for the whole time or if it stays, if it doesn't go in the, um, in the, in the cecum. And also a diagnosis that you propose and management recommendation. Uh, it's important to try to use standard terminology for the bowel prep, for lesion description. And for example, if you are, if the, the indication is bleeding, the bleeding potential of the lesion based on sarin classification. So P2 uh, definitely related to, to bleeding, P1 uh, uncertain and P0 uh, uh, not, uh, improbable. So uh, cross-sectional anterography, uh, these are uh, our radiologist colleagues help us a lot as well in the small bowel exploration. They can show very nicely with CT and MRI the um, thickening of the, of the small bowel wall, if it, there's edema. So it's very useful for uh, Crohn's disease and also polyposis syndromes, but of course, less useful for flat lesions like uh, vascular lesions. But it's also a tool uh, in the small bowel exploration. So uh, you have to be patient when you do uh, capsule endoscopy and, uh, and you will have to know that one small, one small ball capsule endoscopy doesn't mean deep enteroscopy. So you have to read about 17 video capsules to have to get to do one deep enteroscopy. That shows that is a very good first step approach uh, to select which patients you have to go to do in a more invasive uh, procedure, which is uh, the, the device assisted enteroscopy. So what are the therapeutic indications that are going to take you there? Well, it's, as we said, significant findings on, on, on capsule. Uh, suspicion of small bowel disease, if you have ulcers, you want to do biopsies. Uh, if there's suspicion for small bowel tumor, again, biopsies and, and tattooing. Suspicion of a submucosal mass to confirm and maybe also uh, uh, tattoo or biopsy. Polypectomy and inherited polypectomy syndromes like Pes Jaggers, and also refractory celiac disease when you also want to perform biopsies. So we can do a lot of therapeutics nowadays with deep enteroscopy. Uh, we can ab ablate vascular lesions. We can use uh, APC for the uh, flat lesions. We can use clipping. We can do biopsies. We can dilate strictures as well in, in, in Crohn's disease. We can retrieve foreign, uh, foreign bodies, like for example, a retained uh, capsule. Uh, we can uh, uh, do resection, polypectomy, even EMR, uh, percutaneous jejunostomy, and also uh, it's increasingly used as a tool to uh, access to surgical altered anatomy to perform ERCP. So what are the alternatives until, and we have until now? So we have balloon catheter systems, we have double balloon enteroscopy, we have simple balloon enteroscopy, and we have the manual spiral enteroscopy. So the balloon catheter systems, it's um, uh, a through the scope balloon system, uh, which is inflated. It's a 40 meter balloon. Uh, it goes through the operative channel. Uh, you need a 3.7 uh, millimeter channel, so it's, you can put it in a coloscope. And this will be used as an anchoring system to go uh, uh, through uh, to the small bowel. Um, it's, the, the, the studies show that it's um, 
it was limited regarding the, the depth of insertion, as you see here, and also uh, regarding its diagnostic yield. So, uh, and it, it seemed to be inferior than the, 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 the other uh, balloon uh, systems. So it's, um, it's an easy uh, tool to use, but uh, it will, it's, it's still has a limited diagnostic yield. Double balloon heteroscopy, uh, uh, this is the Fuji system. Uh, we have uh, um, a system with uh, two balloons, one balloon on the enteroscope and uh, one balloon on a, an overtube. And these balloons uh, are uh, controlled by um, a pedal and they're inflated, uh, can be inflated alternatively. Uh, this requires two operators. Here you see my friend Ed uh, with one of his colleagues uh, uh, mastering uh, one of these. Uh, and in a, in a way that you uh, alternately uh, inflate the balloons, you can manage to, um, to make your way through the small bile by, by um, uh, uh, pleating it on the, on, the, on the scope and on the overtube. And uh, you can have a very good uh, depth of insertion with this technique and you can do it from anterograde and, and retrograde from the anal root. So this has been uh, very much performed in, in, in the whole world. Um, this is uh, a publication which is 10 years old, but already showed that uh, uh, we have very good um, detection rates uh, regarding the use of double balloon with uh, up to 50% of panateroscopy rates, uh, of course, in expert hands. Uh, major complications are low and are usually uh, uh, acute pancreatitis because you might put a little bit of compression to the pancreas, perforations uh, rarely and, and bleeding, and very, fortunately, very, very low mortality. So single balloon enteroscopy, it's uh, based on the same uh, idea that you will pleat yourself on the small bowel. And instead of having uh, a, a balloon on the, on the, en on the enteroscope, you will uh, kind of like uh, um, use the tip to anchor yourself and pull yourself through with the overtube and use the same uh, movement with uh, the balloon of the overtube. Uh, there, uh, there have been comparative studies, randomized comparative studies comparing, comparing the two balloon systems, double and, and single balloon. And we can see here that um, the rates of complete enteroscopy were, um, uh, were uh, uh, lower in the, in, the, in the single balloon system, but overall um, diagnostic yield uh, was, uh, was similar, if, not significantly different, even if for the double balloon, it was a bit higher. In spiral enteroscopy, uh, this is a completely different uh, system. Uh, this will not use balloons, but use a rotational movement that will transform to longitudinal movement. Uh, in a, but this, the, this, the result is the same. The small intestine is pleated behind the scope and you will advance. So initially this was used with an overtube, a separate overtube, which was 180 centimeters long with the spiral here and the flaps. Uh, and this was compatible with, uh, uh, with, a, with an enteroscope. And uh, uh, it also required two uh, operators, one that's uh, handled the spiral overtube and rotated and the other, the scope and the, and the lumen orientation. And with, by um, straightening the scope, uh, you could also manage to advance in the, in the small bowel. So uh, again, a lot of uh, experience with this, um, with this type of uh, device assistant teroscopy, numerous study that showed that it has a similar safety profile. Uh, it seemed to be uh, faster than the, the, the double balloon in the single balloon systems. There's less pancreatitis and uh, 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 another uh, adverse event that was not uh, usually found in the balloon systems was that there was sometimes esophageal trauma, mostly superficial and uncommonly some deep tears, but rarely perforations. So there's... Um, some comparative studies, uh, some of them retrospective, uh, not all, all of them uh, with a small number of patients, but a meta-analysis uh, was published uh, showing that overall there, um, in eight studies, there was equal diagnostics uh, and therapeutic yields regarding the two types of balloon enteroscopy and uh, the spiral, the manual spiral, with um, an equal depth of insertion, but uh, the spiral seemed to have a shorter procedure time. So it was faster. And here you can see from the different studies. So the similar diagnostic and therapeutic yield between the balloon systems and, and spiral, manual spiral endoscopy, similar depth of insertion, but um, uh, a shorter length of procedure for the spiral. 
So to, uh, to resume, there's no large scale perspective uh, RCTs as comparatives. A summary shows that diagnostic yields are similar, adverse events are similar, a deep, the double balloon seems to be the deepest, single balloon seems the easiest to perform, it's simple, there's only one balloon, and a spiral seems to be the quickest. So uh, some technical considerations uh, for all types of, of, of deep uh, the, the device assistant gyroscopy. Do we use the anterograde or the retrograde? And when do you decide which one to use? How do you do this? Conscious sedation, deep sedation, general anesthesia. Do you do CO2 water? When do you inspect? And uh, still the depth of recession is still challenging and difficult to estimate. So we can go from above and we can go from the retrograde route. And uh, the uh, previous uh, diagnostic procedures, small bowel uh, capsule or the, just the cross-sectional enterography will help us decide. And there's been some interesting studies regarding the, the capsule and the time, the ratio from the time to lesion uh, on the time to cecum or the, the, the time from the pylorus to the lesion from the time from the pylorus to the, to the, um, to the cecum. And uh, they, they show that the ratio uh, can be decided on, on which side to start. So globally, if you are uh, uh, two thirds in the upper part and you find a lesion in, this, in, the, in, this, in the capsule, probably you should go from the anterograde route. And if you're in the last fourth or third, uh, you, will, you will decide on the retrograde route. And this is also uh, reported in the, in the guidelines um, published in 2018 from, the, from endoscopy, from the ACG, where that we use these, these findings uh, to decide which way to go. But if you don't know, uh, or if you have to go there in a massive overbeating, you will choose the anterograde approach because you probably, with the, with the uh, present, the current systems that we have, you will go further down with the anterograde approach. So what kind of... Um, Sedation can we use? Uh, these are long procedures that can be uh, difficult to tolerate. So anxiolysis is not admitted. Uh, conscious sedation with midazolam and opiates uh, as poor tolerance in retrospective series. And so uh, deep sedation uh, is um, probably the minimum uh, way to go um, regarding sedation with propofol. It's short acting with rapid recovery, but it requires trained clinicians. And you have a narrow therapeutic index uh, so if the patient is not intubated, you might have a problem uh, if something goes wrong. And probably general anesthesia is, is the best safety profile, but you need, of course, an anesthesiologist. And it depends, of course, on the setting of each uh, uh, center. Uh, probably the anterograde has a lower threshold for general anesthesia because of the risk of aspiration, the airway protection. For the retrograde route, we could probably use only propofol. It's uh, uh, better tolerated. And I guess this depends on the setting uh, the local organizational protocols. So um, how far do we really go? And we know that in uh, balloon assisted, we will count the net advances of the anteroscope during the insertion. With a spiral, we will count the falls during withdrawal. Both of them are, are very rough estimates. And uh, it's very important to um, always place a tattoo to mark the identified lesion or the deepest point of insertion, at least to know to have a comparative if you go back. CO2 or air, that has been answered in a meta-analysis has grouped the four randomized trials that shows by using CO2, you have a better progression, you have less, less post-procedural pain, so CO2 is recommended. And uh, inspection, uh, you try to inspect all the time, but for the, uh, with the balloon, with the balloon systems, it's easier to respect when, we, when you uh, withdraw as well. Uh, with the spiral, uh, because you might have some uh, uh, erosions induced by the spiral, it's uh, also very important to inspect while you're going down. And I will finish with the performance measure. This is an important uh, paper. Uh, we can see that quality also exists in small bowel endoscopy. And here we see the, the, the key performance measure. So the indication, as I said, has to be in the list of indication that was uh, that's accepted. Uh, the fact that you have a full procedure where you visualize the cecum, that you have a lesion detection rate of more than 50%. And this is also important of what kind of patients you will select for this. And also the timing uh, from the GI bleeding. So for maximum 14 days from over bleeding, as we said before, uh, the appropriate referral to deep enteroscopy 
and also capture retention rate less than uh, 2%. And this will really uh, depend also on your patient selection. You will uh, exclude patients that have a high risk of occlusion, for example, with strictures, et cetera. Also, you can see minor performance measures, the rates of adequate bowel prep and use of standard uh, terminology and reading speed that has to be maximum 10 frames per second, even lower for the proximal part of the small bowel. And uh, the small, uh, uh, the performance measures for deep enteroscopy, as you see, again, indication, uh, completeness means tattooing the, um, the maximum depth of insertion. Laser detection rate has to be more than 50%, again, underlying the the selection process, tattooing of lesions uh, like tumors, uh, complication rate less than 5%, and in minor performance measure, we can see uh, instructions, proper exposure regarding fasting and, and bowel prep is from the retrograde approach, uh, full reports, photo documentation, and a successful interventions regarding therapeutics. So to summarize, uh, small bowel capsule enteroscopy is the cornerstone of small bowel exploration. It's important to use uh, standardized terminology and, and report uh, in an optimal way. Uh, always take into consideration the clinical findings um, and uh, wisely select the patients that will need deep enteroscopy. This is still a challenge. Still, all techniques need training and the depth and speed are not everything. We still have to increase our diagnosing and therapeutic yield. Uh, we follow recommendations and track our quality measures. And this is a really exciting field with many open research questions as we will see uh, in the next uh, lecture. Thank you, Mariana, for the presentation. Uh, I can say that we, as a generation, uh, as an endoscopist, an endoscopic generation, we were very lucky because you, we have seen the revolution of exploring the Midgut. So almost 20 years ago, uh, actually both the uh, capsule endoscopy and the device assisted endoscopy started simultaneously and they evolved. And now we know a lot of things. We know that these two procedures are complementary. Uh, we know the best indication for them. We know that both of them have at least for bleeding, the, the, the same diagnostic yield. We know that both of them are not perfect until now, but at the same time, there are a lot of advance, advancement in both of these modalities to explore the mid-gut. So now it's a great pleasure to introduce Torsten. Torsten is working in Dusseldorf, and uh, he will provide us with uh, uh, evidence on the new options of endoscopy. Thorsten. Yeah, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And um, hopefully, or maybe we will see, or, or we have seen another revolution in uh, the approach to the small bowel during the last months or, or years. So I'm very happy to present to you new options with motorized spiral endoscopy. Um, so let's see if ah, now it's working. OK, so you already learned in uh, Mariana's excellent presentation about main indications for deep endoscopy. I'm not going to repeat this. And you also have, have also seen the standard uh, techniques for device assisted endoscopy. In principle, we have two different techniques, balloon assisted techniques. Um, uh, that use, usually use push and pull technique. And then we have the spiral endoscopy technique yet that um, has the principle to transform the rotational uh, energy uh, of the, the rotating spiral to, um, uh, to transform this into longitudinal movement of the enteroscope. Um, so we had, uh, Mariana also mentioned this meta-analysis comparing the two methods of deep endoscopy without any significant differences in terms of diagnostic and therapeutic success rates, uh, death of maximum insertion, rate of complete endoscopy, and rate of adverse events. However, um, it was found that the procedure time was significantly shorter for spiral endoscopy. So um, in November 2015, um, the first in human case of the novel motorized spiral enteroscopy, uh, the power spiral enteroscopy uh, was performed in our institution in Düsseldorf. And uh, um, it was very 
successful. So um, uh, the, the aim of uh, Olympus uh, was um, uh, after acquiring the technology from, um, from Spirus Medical uh, um, and further develop the system to develop the quickest, easiest and deepest method for deep uh, endoscopy with the aim to simplify the procedure to make it effective also with standard endoscopic skills to eliminate the overtube, to integrate the spiral into the system, reduce the complication rate and uh, achieve greater depth of insertion, but retain the advantages of um, spiral enteroscopy uh, that are mainly the speed of the procedure and also the control that you have about uh, your position in the small bowel. A short video. So you have in the power spiral, you have an integrated electric motor and you have this uh, short spiral overtube uh, that is mounted onto the insertion tube portion. So um, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, the endoscope to, uh, and connected. So uh, maybe I can stop the, the video because I cannot see it very quickly. Okay, I hope you can still hear me. Um, so I go first. So you have this uh, spiral overtube um, that is mounted on the insertion tube portion of the endoscope. Um, and then uh, uh, it is rotated clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, um, using uh, a foot pedal switch by um, means of this electric motor. So, so we have, I have now some problems. Okay, hopefully you can see now the, the slide about um, the first trial that we performed. It was a prospective uh, um, B-centric trial that we performed together with um, uh, the, the team um, from uh, Brussels um, on uh, motorized spiral endoscopy, on untergrade power spiral endoscopy. Prospectively, 132 patients were included and primary objective of this was the diagnostic yield of power spiral, untergrade power spiral endoscopy in patients with suspected small bowel disease. The technical success rate uh, of um, in this trial was 97%. What mean uh, only four patients um, uh, were not successful. Technical success was achieved after um, uh, passing the instrument beyond the lig ligament of trites. Uh, two patients had strictures in the esophagus and two uh, of the duodenum that were previously not known. Um, mean insertion depth beyond ligament of trites was 450 centimeters. And if you uh, have a look at the range in, in, uh, up to 600 centimeters, 600 was uh, the insertion depth of total undergrade endoscopy. This was achieved uh, in 10.6% of all patients from the undergrade approach uh, with a mean procedure time of 28 minutes. So um, hopefully you can see the video better than I can see it, but I know it very well because this is a video of the first total uh, undergrade enteroscopy that we were able to achieve by passing the tip of the enteroscope through the elastical valve to the cecum. So, um, in terms of the primary endpoint, the diagnostic yield, um, uh, we found an overall diagnostic yield um, of all procedures of 74.2%. That was uh, quite high. Uh, it was highest for patients that, that um, underwent power spiral for uh, indeterminate MRI findings and lowest for patients that had the suspicion of inflammatory lesions or polyp lesions in the video capsule endoscopy. So um, as we included in this trial, um, the first in human case and the cases from our learning curves as well, we um, decided not to include a control group in this, in this trial. However, we compared uh, our results 
to um, the results from the literature. We had this on the basis, of, this was done on basis of this meta-analysis of four randomized controlled trials recently published that found a diagnostic yield of balloon-assisted enteroscopy of 48%. Of course, there are um, single reports or single trials from expert centers that achieve higher diagnostic yield, but uh, this was from a meta-analysis. And so comparing this, um, um, at least uh, the power spiral diagnostic yield was not inferior. So um, power spiral is a therapeutic uh, instrument as well. As you can see, we had a very high rate, 68.2% um, therapeutic yield. Um, if you leave out all interventions that are only biopsies or only perform for tattooing the um, maximum insertion death, and remarkably, 100% of the procedures were successful, including EMR cases or even um, removal of a retained video capsule. Um, post hoc, we did an analysis of the learning curve as well. So I just show you the graphs, but um, uh, in the analysis, we could see that um, there was no significant difference um, uh, between the first 30 cases and the last 30 cases in terms of the uh, success rates, uh, procedural time, insertion death, and adverse event rate. What means uh, power spiral obviously has a very short learning curve. Um, and if we're talking about spiral endoscopy, we have, discuss, we have to discuss uh, adverse events rate. So we had an adverse um, um, rate of serious adverse events of 1.5%. We had one delayed perforation in the distal ileum 48 hours after um, uh, uh, uneventful power spiral, but then um, uh, the patient developed symptoms and had to undergo laparoscopic suturing. Um, so APC was performed. We're not sure if this um, perforation was attributable to APC or power spiral. And then we had one uh, delayed bleeding from a laceration at the GE junction that needed red blood cell transfusion and endoscopic clip clipping. We had no device associated um, non-anticipated serious adverse events in this trial. So we were very much encouraged by these results. And then we um, conducted the second trial um, uh, uh, with a primary endpoint of achieving a total enteroscopy. Um, so uh, again, we uh, worked together with the Brussels team and included patients with indication for complete enteroscopy. Uh, on day one, we performed the untergrade power spiral and on day two, um, uh, we performed retrograde approach uh, if the untergrade approach was incomplete. Um, so uh, this, the, the, the full publication was um, uh, published in GI endoscopy um, at the end of uh, October this year. So I will go through the results. In terms of the primary endpoint, uh, we had a very high rate of um, overall, uh, overall um, total enteroscopy rate of 70% in these patients that were not operated before. Um, uh, of which 16.6% um, were complete from the untergrade approach and 53.4% were completed then from the retrograde approach. So it seems to be a very effective power spiral in achieving total enteroscopy. Um, so in between, there were also reports from other centers, not only from Düsseldorf and Brussels. Um, these uh, results are from uh, the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. My friend Mohan uh, and his co-workers um, uh, published this retrospective trial um, um, on various indications on um, um, power spiral endoscopy, and this confirmed our results, high technical success rates of 93%, 70% diagnostic yield, total endoscopy rate was 60.6%, but 31.1% from the untergrade approach, that seems to be very high, may be related to the different um, uh, Indian population compared to Western Europe. Uh, and then we had more um, uh, publication. One case report from Hong Kong showed um, 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 total undergrade endoscopy in a relatively old patient just under con uh, conscious sedation. So this seems to be uh, um, um, possible. This is also our 
uh, our experience and finally more uh, publications this uh, time from Brussels um, um, on uh, other cases ha having been performed. So this was uh, what we have on um, enteroscopy. We uh, know that uh, power spiral is effective for colonoscopy as well. But I was always asked in the last years, what about power spiral for ESCP? And I'm lucky to uh, present the first data that we have. So uh, recently we published on this first tri uh, trial, um, a first, first case that has been performed uh, on a, a patient after rural ipsilon reconstructive surgery and bilioenteric anastomosis with successful power spiral um, endoscopy and dilatation. Um, I think we have the time to show the, the short video. Maybe I can jump a little bit forward to uh, make this more quick. As you can see um, uh, in, the, in the fluoroscopic image, um, um, usually you have some looping in the stomach when you push the enteroscope uh, forward uh, and to pass the pylorus and once the, uh, the spiral part engages the pylorus um, it uh, is this more or less self-propelling and uh, you go deep into the small bowel and uh, at this stage usually you have to pull the scope to straighten the position and remove the loop from the stomach. I jump a little bit forward that you can see the ESCP procedure. So it's usually relatively quick then. And now we are approaching the hepatobiliary limb. Um, and then you, when, once you enter the hepatobiliary limb, you use again spiral rotation. And then if you come, oh, sorry. Sorry, I go back a little bit. We found this severe stricture of this bilioenteric anastomosis. And what's very important that you can use uh, standard uh, instruments for ESCP that you know from your usual, uh, um, usual practice because of the short length of the enteroscope. That's very helpful. And you can use standard catheters, wires, and balloons to perform this treatment. And um, now we might have a reliable tool to uh, simplify enteroscopy assisted ESCP in the future. And I will go forward to the first series that we presented during virtual UEGW uh, some weeks ago, the first 10 cases, all with Ruan Ypsilon um, uh, anatomy uh, and indication for ESCP. We had a technical success rate for enteroscopy in reaching the papilla or the bilioenteric anastomosis of 80% and then technical success rate of ESCP, cannulation of the papilla or bilioenteric anastomosis, overall 87%. And in terms of uh, normal papilla, it was 75% and um, uh, bilioenteric anastomosis 100%. Technical success of the intervention, 100% uh, and overall procedure time, 70 uh, minutes. So I would like to give a short summary. Usually when we approach to small bowel diseases, we now nowadays have a tailored step-up approach. Um, usually we start with a non-invasive imaging modality prior to device-assisted enteroscopy. Um, after that, power spiral is now a disruptive technology that's promising as a novel, effective and safe diagnostic and therapeutic approach to the entire small bowel. Um, now we have available data, data available from two prospective and one retrospective trial showing its efficacy. Currently, um, the, the uh, multi-center prospective registry is unrolling and the results will be there at the end of 2020. Uh, and um, the power spiral has now the potential to change the diagnostic and therapeutic algorithm uh, um, in the approach to small bowel diseases in the near future but there's still need for further careful, uh, careful evaluation, especially um, in comparative trials in patients with altered anatomy and for biliopancreatic interventions. Thank you for your kind attention. And uh, I hope we have enough time to discuss the different clinical indication technical issues. All right, Dr. Bena, thank you very much for giving us the the new data on the new era of endoscopy, uh, motorized endoscopy, automated motorized endoscopy. It's, 
is now it's not future it's it's our present now right. hopefully and uh, hopefully it will be available uh, in more said a more uh, centers throughout the globe and i think uh, that the, we have uh, uh, a quarter of an hour to discuss uh, especially uh, or using some cases that you kindly prepared so i would ask uh, also mariana to be with us and see the cases and we can discuss uh, on the cases and uh, i will try to give you at the same time some questions uh, which are posted by our attendees let's go to the first case please yes uh, so i prepared some cases uh, for basis of our discussion um, so uh, we agreed to have the general indications we will have one case of suspected mid gi tumor one case with um, uh, GI mani suspected manifestation of an IBD, one suspected bleeding case, and if we have time enough, we can discuss uh, polypectomy um, techniques. So the first case, we had a 49-year-old year male patient with uh, recurrent episodes of diarrhea together with flush. Um, the patient had the history of a microadenoma of the pituitary gland uh, without endocrine activity, EGD and colonoscopy provided no pathological findings, and CT scan and um, uh, of the abdominal and thorax were without findings. So, but based on based on the clinical symptomatics, the patient underwent uh, functional imaging based on the somatostatin receptor. Uh, underwent this um, um, gallium dotatate PET CT scan, showing this. Um, uh, uh, this uh, uptaking uh, small mass in the small bowel and video capsule endoscopy showed this. This was uh, suspicious of a, a subepithelial lesion. So I will go to the uh, to a short video. Luckily, this case was <laughs> done during uh, um, uh, recording sessions, so I could show the uh, could show you the video. Um, yes. He shows the untrade approach in this case, um, despite the fact that uh, um, the, the lesion seems to be quite deep inside. But as you can see, with the help of uh, our head nurse, it was possible to go really deep into the small bowel. And in the, uh, in the mid part of the small uh, in the, of the ileum, we found this subepithelial lesion. Uh, this was obviously the, uh, the target uh, side. And so I decided then usually you cannot find anything in the biopsies, but then I decided to take some biopsies from the surface that led to this bleeding. So I had to clip and this is usually please recognize that you have a very stable position in the small bowel using the, the spiral because if the spiral does not move, it maintains the position in the small bowel and you can apply therapy, you know, from colonoscopy. Um, clipping and um, uh, using injection. So I uh, placed the clip, the bleeding stopped, and then we placed an uh, ink dye marker. Usually this is done first injection of a saline blab and then injection of uh, India ink to mark this for um, this site for the surgeon and then the procedure uh, was done. So Power spy was really helpful to reach this and to identify and to mark the lesion for the surgeon. So, Torsten, questions? Do you still uh, dilate the upper esophageal sphincter before introducing the spiral? Yeah, this this uh, was what we were doing in the in the trials because we were um, afraid of. Uh, um, um, some some um, lacerations, but nowadays we don't do. We assess the patients prior to um, prior to um, a power spiral, and if there's no history of of, uh, of strictures and no, um, no no clinical signs of strictures and um, uh, and so on, and if we have a normal anatomy, then we don't dilate. But we have to be aware if we um, encounter some resistance during insertion of the uh, of the spiral path through the esophagus. We stop rotation. Uh, usually we don't intubate the patients anymore for undergrade power spiral. If we intubate, then we uh, um, um, unblock the balloon of the, um, uh, of the, of the tube to, to release the pressure. But 
uh, if this does not work, then we go back, inspect the mucosal surface, and if we don't find any lacerations there, then we try again. But in case it does not work, then we um, we will dilate with a bougie uh, between 18 and 20 uh, 20 millimeters because the the stiff part of the spiral overtube is 18 millimeters in diameter. We we still dilate. Uh, we uh, we prefer to still have the. Um... Uh, the, the the safe uh, the safe technique and uh, there's been some episodes of of, uh, of facial obstruction so we still prefer the late with a, a 20 millimeter bougie and as well you have the opportunity to check the stomach uh, another you know another time sometimes you have gastric findings that can explain uh, uh, the, the 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 clinical uh, setting so it's we still we still uh, we still dilate before doing the spiral. Okay, I would say that we, we should go forward because we are running out of time. Let's go to the next case, please. Okay. So the next case, uh, ah, this was the final diagnostic. Uh, diagnosis was a neuroendocrine tumor. So the second case, uh, we had a female, 56 year old, no comorbidities, with a new onset of recurrent epigastric abdominal pain since eight weeks. Uh, EGD and colonoscopy uh, provided no findings, but the transabdominal ultrasound showed a thickening um, of the small bar wall and uh, the fecal calprotectin level were um, elevated. So the patient um, uh, got this MRI and this showed uh, and confirmed the thickening of the, uh, of the small bar wall. And uh, then um, in the referring hospital, different approaches were, were uh, attempted. Double balloon enteroscopy, transaural and transanally was not able to reach the region of interest. And then the patient was given a video capsule endoscopy that showed um, suspicion of inflammatory changes, but um, unfortunately the capsule was retained. So, so the patient was referred to our institution and we performed this. So we performed an antegrade power spiral Endoscopy. As you can see, preparation of this patient was a little bit limited because of the um, uh, emergency setting after retained uh, retainment of the capsule. So, but as you can see, it was relatively quick uh, to advance the scope to the small bowel. Um, usually, after passing the ligament of trites, uh, pleating of the small bowel is uh, very effective and you can go very quickly through the first two or three meters of the small bowel just by activating rotation. And then we came here and as you can see, I will stop this for you in this. So, so you can see this stricture with some ulcerations. Uh, so in your, in your opinion, is this, uh, could this be an IBD or what would be your suggestion for the diagnos diagnosis? Also, I would suggest to, to, to let the video play. Yeah, okay, we go. Mariana, what do you say about the diagnosis? Uh, it doesn't look like Crohn's disease. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But as you can see, we found the capsule. So the capsule. Capsule, the capsule was, uh, went through, but uh, then we were able to catch the capsule after taking biopsies to um, catch the capsule with a net. And then um, we were able just to activate the uh, backward rotation and then uh, quickly brought out the, um, the capsule. So I go forward. So this, of course, was not an IBD, but uh, histopathology showed this diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, in the staging, no signs of further manifestation. So the patient underwent chemo and immun immunotherapy. So before going to the next case, uh, we have uh, a lot of questions regarding the safety of, of motorized spiral. So a couple of questions uh, uh, of our attendees about the, uh, uh, how does the spiral, automated spiral compares to the other device assisted endoscopy regarding uh, the adverse events? And how can you comment on the reported five perforations uh, using spiral? And uh, can we identify people, uh, patients that are, might be prone to develop perforation and then avoid the spiral? So um, as we did not perform any comparative trials, um, uh, there is no, no clear evidence for this. But 
um, the the system uh, itself is equipped with a kind of safety mechanism because um, you don't feel what the spiral rotation does. Um, uh, so this is done by an electric motor, but the system itself monitors the, the force that is um, transmitted to the uh, mucosal surface and to the tissue by monitoring the current that is needed for rotation. And if this exceeds a certain threshold, the system automatically stops. This is uh, the automatic safety function to prevent um, um, uh, tissue um, laceration by the spiral. However, um, this uh, might not completely rule out perforation. As you have seen, we had one perforation in our trial um, with more than 130 cases. This is within the threshold uh, that we expect from, from uh, interventional um, uh, deep endroscopy. Um, uh, so I'm uh, not afraid of a higher um, uh, rate of adverse events uh, uh, based on the data that we have. Maybe we will have more data from the registry because this reflects more the clinical reality, but yeah. up to now, um, yeah, if we uh, look at the, um, at the um, uh, uh, rotation force indicator that is provided with the system that gives us a feedback and if we stop when the system has several emergency motor stops uh, then I uh, think there's no higher uh, um, perforation rate to be expected and so uh, our um, experience um, in passing strictures is still limited um, uh, but uh, up to now, we had no complications related to passage of, uh, of strictures, even in IBD patients. Mariana, what's your experience? But for the, for the esophagus, which is, I think, the, the, the scariest part, um, what we try to do is we still dilate with the, the bougie, uh, hyperextension, lots of gel, and deflate the, the, the endotracheal tube. And we follow the monitor, as, as Torsten pointed out, this is a very good indicator. Uh, if we feel any resistance with the forward uh, pedal, then you go back. And sometimes just by going back, you will deplete something, a mucosal fold or something, and you will uh, free the system. If you see that you have, have some kind of uh, erosions, uh, if they're deep, I, I would stop. I don't take any risks. But this has been uh, quite quite rare in the um, in our trial and also in the in the in the in the registry that we're doing now. We still have some patients where I have maybe one or two from the whole uh, patients that we put in the registry from about thirty patients where I, I I got blocked and I and I stopped and I took the double balloon. Uh, this can happen. It's related to anatomy. Uh, also, we uh, to, to select the patients beforehand. We did not include up to now. We still do not include patients with um, eosinophilic esophagitis and with uh, esophageal viruses and with known strictures, of course. Okay, can we go now to the next case? Um, so we're going to the next case, um, a 74 year old patient with recurrent massive bleeding episodes under intake of aspirin after, um, uh, after myocardial infarction, EGD colonoscopy without findings that explained the bleeding. Video capsule endoscopy showed two small uh, uh, bulb polyps and single balloon endoscopy was uh, attempted but did not reach the region of uh, interest from both um, approaches. So I show you the, the video, start here. So first we started from the antebrain approach. Um, relatively quick, uh, we reached this polypoid lesion. So I, uh, thought it would be a good idea to remove this polyp. So as you can see, very stable position. You can apply therapy, you know, from the colon, inject the submucosa, and then you use the snare to do polypectomy. But as you can uh, see, after injection, we had all this blood here around. So um, luckily, no severe bleeding after this polyp, but I uh, then prefer to place a clip. Um, because we were relatively deep inside the small bowel, we then changed to the retrograde approach. We turned the patient around and went for the retrograde approach after passing the column, then intubation of the idiosecal valve. Usually I prefer to um, 
to use a short uh, transparent hood uh, for uh, for enteroscopy. Um, and this also, in my point of view, facilitates intubation of the ileocecal valve. And then once the spiral is engaged uh, into the ileocecal valve and beyond the ileocecal valve, this is really effective power spiral from the retrograde approach. So we went a little bit forward and then we reached this area, this polypoid mass with a little bit of fibrin here. But then I wanted to be sure, so we passed this uh, this tumor, and uh, after the uh, the next perf, we we found this. So this was a clip. So total integrate uh, total enteroscopy was uh, was achieved and confirmed. So then we had this this uh, small tumor. So I placed um, a clip here. We found more of this. Uh, we placed an ink dye marker here. We found more of these polyps next to the uh, to the large polyploid mass. So again, I just took a biopsy. Uh, but again, we had massive bleeding after this biopsy. So we had to clip. Uh, again, um, this is relatively easy using the power spiral. You have a uh, dedicated irrigation capability of the system that's really helpful. And of course, a 3.2 millimeter working channel. So we had this mass here. And then I wanted to place another ink dye marker uh, distal, of, um, distal of this lesion. So this was performed here. And then I went back and then I found another polyp. So um, uh, we wanted uh, to be sure that after resection of the, the marked site, there were no polyps left. So um, I uh, tried to do an EMR here of this polyp. Again, a massive bleeding uh, up just after injection of the submucosa. So in this case, it was um, uh, uh, the bleeding continued. So the first step was then to um, remove the polyp and then uh, immediately place a clip onto the resection side. Um, and then after that, use the snare to remove this polyp. So a lot of bleeding, but so these were the results. Um, histopathology of the resected polyps showed only granulation tissue with erosive alterations without signs of neoplasia. But, however, because of the subepithelial tumor that I suspected, um, um, uh, an abdominal CT scan was performed. There was no clear um, um, evidence of an intestinal tumor, but the suspected large hemangioma of the liver of four centimeters in the left liver lobe. And, um, so these were the final results. This was a tumor. We referred the patient to surgery. Um, he, uh, he received a segmental resection of the small bowel. And also during the surgery, a palpable mass was seen. And histopathology showed in this tumor, not an epithelial solid tumor, but a large cavernous hemangioma of the small bowel. That is a relatively rare, but uh, uh, indication um, um, uh, cause of massive uh, small bowel bleeding. So the patient after that uh, had no further bleeding. Okay, and let's go quickly to the last case. Yeah, so this is just a technical question. Maybe we have some time. A patient, a young female patient with Poitier syndrome um, uh, had recurrent large hem uh, hematomas of the small bowel with obstruction. And I wanted, just wanted to show you this this video of this large pedunculated tumor. Again, um, if we have this stable position of the scope within the small bowel, you can apply therapy, as you know from the colon, just inject uh, below the polyp. And then uh, you can um, apply snare resection um, the risk loss of the stable position. But of course, uh, there may be other uh, techniques to um, deal with these kinds of tumors. You maybe um, you do something else. Maybe you don't have to. Re uh, you maybe use an endo loop, or maybe uh, you use an endo loop without resection after that. What is your strategy? Uh, we we also uh, sometimes just put clips, cross uh, cross sectional clips like this, yeah. and a ninety degrees angle. Uh, and we, it's a bit like putting an end loop and not resecting it, uh, and we let it go because it's a very low uh, risk of uh, cancerization in the amartomas. 
um, but uh, these patients can, uh, uh, they can have a lot of polyps and it can be difficult uh, procedures and they can, yeah. they can bleed as well when you resect them. Yes. So better place a clip after resection. Yeah, as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, we already discussed the different approaches that we could have to, to uh, small bowel polyps. And these were the uh, four cases that I prepared for today. Thank you, Dawson. Uh, I would, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just one thing. So mm -hmm. uh, I would like to invite you all to, to attend our uh, Düsseldorf Endoscopy Symposium uh, in February next year. Um, because of the pandemic, we switched to a live stream events. So if you want to learn more about Power Spiral and others presented by international experts, please visit us. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Torsten. Thank you, Mariana. We spent it, uh, some of the discussion time during the presentation mm -hmm. of the case. I think this was very nice. And uh, as the time goes by and before say goodbye, two quick questions. So is uh, a previous history of abdominal surgery contraindication for uh, power motorized spiral? But now in the, in the first studies, it was uh, an exclusion criteria, but now we're starting to include them. In the registry, uh, there are, there are, it's, we can include patients with, with previous surgery and we also uh, are, are also trying to, to perform ERCP uh, and endoscopy is the ERCP. So uh, in these patients, in, in, at least in the alternate anatomy ones, and I think Torsten has, has the same feeling that the, the progression is, is quite easy uh, in these patients. Um, so this is, this is good because these are probably the ones with the altered anatomy, this uh, previous surgery that we want to use enteroscopy on. And my last question from our attendees is, have you, has either of you performed ERCP using the uh, motorized uh, enteroscopy in a bariatric patient? Yes, we have uh, experience of uh, three patients after a very long ruan epsilon uh, bypass. So uh, uh, all these three patients were successfully um, 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 investigated and also ESCP um, with a native papilla was successful. We had one uh, also it was uh, in, a, in a big stone. So we categorized, we cannulated, but it's sometimes the big stones are difficult to extract because you don't have the same movements as the duodenoscope. So you have to go for backwards to bring, to do your extraction. So we still have a lot of things to learn, but two things is that <laughs> you always choose the wrong loop at the beginning <laughs> and uh, 60 centimeters when the surgeon says it's never 60 centimeters, it's more. <laughs> so this is what I retained from my case. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of exciting things to do uh, still in this area. So, okay, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for sharing the, your knowledge and your expertise in the field of exploring the Midgut. It was really a pleasure to have you both here. And at this moment, I would like to say, to, to, to inform everyone that this recording uh, will be posted on the learning session of the EG website. At the same place, you can find our previous web, uh, webinars and you can take the time, check them out uh, whenever you wish. And I would like to thank the EAG governing board for giving us the opportunity to have this activity, uh, my webinar team, especially David and Gabriella, and of course, uh, Olympus for uh, giving us, uh, 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 for sponsoring uh, this activity. And our next webinar is on December uh, 2. We have uh, on the 2nd of December, we have also a satellite symposium on ESD. And until that time, we have still time for abstract submission for our Congress EAGDH 2020 uh, until November 30. And we are looking forward to see you again in our next uh, uh, webinar. So enjoy the rest of the evening and au revoir. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.